Ron Shook here to continue our discussion of how we dissect frogs in our class. Uh, today we will focus on the external anatomy. In other words, we're not going to cut into the frog today, but we're going to look at the external features and uh, see what those features might have to do with the way the frog functions. So uh, anatomy and physiology, structure and function um, will be uh, one of our focuses as we dissect. As with many other things in science, labeling will be important. You've been given a little baggie uh, that will contain your frog. And right now, I just would like you to label it with your table number. So if I were in period four, table three, I would use a Sharpie and label my bag clearly as 4-3. This helps me stay organized. I'll keep all the period four frogs in one area, and that way we can have them ready for you when you show up for your class. We will wear gloves during the dissection. The gloves we use are made out of a substance called nitrile. That is my choice for a couple of reasons. The dexterity or ability to move around with one's fingers is very good with nitrile uh, gloves. Also, um, I'm going to show you here it's okay to inflate just a bit to make it easier to uh, aim for a thumb and a pinky. Nitrile is also known as uh, being relatively low in causing allergies as opposed to latex. So the word is, if you have a latex allergy, it is okay to be wearing the gloves that I've supplied for you. There can be a lot of reasons why someone wears gloves in a laboratory. If we were working with petri dishes with live bacteria, we may want to prevent getting bacteria on our hands. That's not the way uh, or the reason that we're going to wear gloves when we dissect our frog. The purpose here is that the frog has been preserved. And it's been preserved because there are chemicals in the body, in particular formaldehyde, that will prevent other organisms from living on this dead frog. The good news is you don't need to be worried about catching something from the frog. You will not catch a bacteria or you will not pick up a virus from this dead frog. However, because formaldehyde has toxicity, uh, it's something we need to be careful with. These days, uh, frogs sold to schools have had a very high percentage of the formaldehyde moved with a type of washing solution. So uh, the amount of formaldehyde is about as low as it can be while still allowing it to do the job of keeping frogs preserved. But these gloves are primarily to protect you from coming in contact with the formaldehyde. Formaldehyde should not get in your mouth, it should not get in your eyes, and it should not get on your skin. If some formaldehyde accidentally gets on some of your ungloved skin, simply go to the sink, wash with soap and water, and you'll be fine. But uh, this is a good protection. You shouldn't be spending a lot of time uh, with your skin and your hands in contact uh, with a formaldehyde-preserved organism. So next, uh, we're going to get to look at the external anatomy of some frogs. I buy my frogs from scientific supply companies. Those companies raise frogs specifically for the purpose uh, of being scientific specimens. Uh, this is a, the way the frogs come to me. They come in a, a bag. They've had, again, most of the uh, chemicals removed from them. And in this sort of vacuum-packed state, I get um, all of these frogs. Now I'm going to open up this bag so that we can get at some of the specimens. These are preserved grass frogs, and I will take one of them out. This will be about the size of your frogs. 
Um, so we are able to observe the external anatomy of this specimen. You'll notice that there are two sides to the frog. Um, the dorsal side that's facing you and now the ventral side. We'll go over those uh, terms in some more detail later. For right now, um, I want you to take a look at your frog, examine the head, examine that whole back side, get a look at the front legs, how might they be different from the back legs, what might these anatomical differences uh, have to do with the function of the different legs or the physiology of these two legs. Um, look for any changes or interesting bumps or shapes. Uh, speculate on what uh, those might be for. And right now I'm going to ask you to pause this video, get acquainted with your frog, and then come back to the video where I'll point out some of the features that I notice. So I hope you've had time to examine your frog. I'm going to point out a few of the things uh, that I see, but uh, we're going to start out with some very common terms so that we can use them both now and in the future. So um, specimens with bilateral symmetry, um, which would include all the animals with backbones, um, are going to have a ventral side, or what you would tend to call your front side or your tummy side. This is the ventral side of the frog. If we flip that over, we use this word, the word dorsal. So your back um, is your dorsal side, and you're looking at the dorsal side of this frog. Now, some other orientation words that can be useful. Um, this frog can seem to be moving in a certain direction. So as the frog moves forward, uh, that would be called the anterior side. And as we look at its rear end, that is what we would call its posterior side. So hopefully that will help with talking about orientation of the frog. Um, as I look at the dorsal side of the frog, it has two prominent eyes. They are located, relatively speaking, toward the top of the head, much more toward the top of their head than my eyeballs are. Mine are very um, ventral facing. These are uh, dorsal side eyes. Near the edge of the eye, let me grab a dissecting needle here for a moment. As we find some of this shape here, you'll notice a little circle area called the tympanic membrane. One of the ways to sense motion and sound by the frog. The dorsal side of grass frogs is uh, full of uh, colors. Uh, melanin-filled cells that uh, give it a color that generally will allow it to blend in with um, things like bottoms of ponds, uh, grass and soil, things of that sort. Um, on the ventral side, it is a very light color. Uh, if something is looking at the frog from beneath uh, and the frog is in water, um, the sky will have a, a, a lighter appearance, and um, I believe that has something to do with the ventral area being light in color. It is a, a camouflage advantage that has been selected for by nature. And um, if we look at the front legs, there are individual digits that can be seen. On the back leg, there are also individual digits that can be seen. But if we pry around on here, we can also see that there is definite webbing between the rear toes. So uh, I would argue that these front feet 
uh, have some uses that involve grasping, uh, whereas these rear feet are excellent paddles for these excellent swimmers. Uh, on the same idea of being an excellent swimmer, uh, these rear legs are very strong and powerful uh, compared to the, the size of this organism. So uh, frogs not only are good jumpers, something that most of us have seen, but they are outstanding swimmers, which uh, often we don't get to see because they're below the water and uh, unless we're uh, specifically trying to see them swim underwater, we, we miss that. But what a great design. Uh, when we get to look at the tissues back here and get a look at these muscles, uh, they are indeed quite impressive. So um, we're going to uh, see you again tomorrow uh, to start to get at uh, some, some of the different types of tissues that you'll encounter. Thank you.